Yeah, I a couple of things um, that came out of that. First is the 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 thinking about how the theories and the writing about um, kind of post soul, I guess, aesthetics and the sound and the music, um, you know, kind of critique what they see is the heterosexism and I guess the patriarchy of soul and the black nationalist era. But so many of them are like, are men. I mean, they're men themselves. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing. Um, and um, I guess I want to hear from both of you backtracking on that and kind of piggybacking on that at the same time. Like who who were the women um, kind of architects of, of this music in your mind? I'm happy to, to address that. There's a lot of different ways to talk about that question or to address that question. Um, but yeah, first, I guess, just to quickly like piggyback off of what Linnea was saying about this, like very deeply entrenched for those people who maybe aren't aware of the conversation, like narrative of decline, like the declension narrative, right? About like what, what happened to soul? This is Nelson George and the death of rhythm and blues, which I, I think is actually a really great book. Um, but, but it's just, you know, I think that there's a lack of awareness sometimes about how oddly almost convenient it is that just as women, queer, and non-binary folks' voices, you know, come to the fore. There's a narrative of decline, like what happened to black music, like, you know, um, which often gets coded as, oh no, it's a problem of commercialism. It's a problem of exploitation and that that's what the decline is. But I, I wanted to ask, are we sure that that's really what people are talking about and responding to? Um, because I think in fact, it, it might have more to do with this idea of the diversification of black representation that makes certain people kind of anxious, right? The gatekeepers within black culture, as well as without, um, that want to still police the, the boundaries, um, you know, of, of what soul itself was, right? In, in the first place. Um, in addition to a larger, I think, and even more problematic kind of dominant cultural narrative that wants to demonize the black arts and black power movements themselves with which soul has been associated right so if the dominant culture is saying like oh you know black nationalism is bad you know this whole moment um, is one that maybe yielded something but now we have gotten over it um you know i think that the very persistence of soul is saying like that's, you know, first of all, Soul Itself was way more complicated and interesting and, and, and vital um, than that narrative would, would suggest. Um, but also that its persistence suggests that there is something, um, a need for resilience and resistance that is, is very much ongoing. Um, and so again, narratives of decline and declension, um, I think are, are largely a product of a kind of what I call post-revolutionary backlash that would demonize the movement and make it seem like, you know, nothing emerged from it um, that, was, that was absolutely necessary and crucial. Um, some of those women that I see at the, the center of the soul story, you know, are Gladys Knight um, and the Pips, even though, like I say, they tend to be sidelined in favor of other people like James Brown and what Lene calls the kind of patriarchs of soul, right? The James Browns, Isaac Hayes, George Clinton. Um, but centralizing Gladys Knight, uh, Nina Simone, Aretha Franklin, certainly, even people like Ann Peebles, who might have been lesser known, and Minnie Riperton. Those are some of my kind of key um, women figures in the in the book. And then I'll just quickly touch on to some of the key theorists of soul, which for me include um, somebody like Phil Garland, who was a really important um, music journalist, uh, you know, who wrote a lot of interviews of soul um, artists, profile based um, or interview based profiles of, of soul artists in Ebony Magazine, where she was an editor. Um, she was the first tenured black woman professor at the Columbia University School of Journalism. Um, and somebody who I most regret not getting that she passed before um, I could actually speak with her about this um, book. She has her own book, The Sound of Soul, um, which she published in 1969. So she's a key um, sort of theoretical conceptual architect of the idea of soul, as is somebody finally like Nikki Giovanni, who writes so, so beautifully and so um, rigorously, militantly about Aretha Franklin and her centrality um, to the, the soul moment. Mm -hmm. And I would actually, because I think that there's also a gap in scholarship for the so-called post-soul movement in terms of women's voices. So thinking about sort of lack of scholarship around Anita Baker, Patrice Russian, Melissa Morgan, Cheryl Lynn, you know, even, I mean, I would, Tracy Chapman, different category, but, but just still thinking about that gap in study of those women that, you know, um, 
we're actually experiencing this parallel emergence with the Toni Morrisons and the Alice Walkers and the Toni Cades in the 1980s. Like, where is the scholarship on Cheryl Lynn and Shirley Murdoch and right those women? And so, yeah, I think um, in response to this decline narrative, we've lost these stories um, and these histories and their connections to the patriarchs, to Zapp and Roger, and and to you know, you, I mean, I think there's an interesting amount of scholarship on the 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 women who Prince, you know, was involved with, but not as much. Like, what truly we need to know a whole lot more about, like Wendy and Lisa, and you know, just and even Sheila E. It's just like we need to know a lot more about who they are individually, what their cultural contributions are as masters of their craft outside of the context of Prince. <laughs>